The views and opinions expressed in this video are those of the speakers and panelists and do not necessarily reflect the position of the Ethos Institute for Public Christianity and its founding institutions and organizations. Is Jesus God? Migrant workers and human rights from a Christian perspective. Marriage and family. ISIS presents a much bigger threat. How do we integrate the Bible with our scientific understanding? Are you able to actually describe and articulate clearly your own sense of purpose in life? So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, I want to thank uh, the organizers, um, Ethos Institute, uh, the Nas National Council of Churches of Singapore, uh, Theological uh, Trinity Theological College, as well as the Singapore Bible Society. Uh, I hope all of you had a, had a good lunch, um, you know, uh, food for the bodies, and now hopefully I can provide, um, you know, some food for thought. Um, so let me just uh, share my screen first. Okay, so so I'm I'm gonna talk about the the MRHA. Um, I know the earlier speakers have made a reference to it, um, but let me assure you that I'm not gonna go into a deep uh, legal analysis. I, I think that's not appropriate for uh, today, uh, but obviously, you know, I will touch on uh, various aspects of the uh, MRHA. Uh, this was the brief, um, you know, that, that, that I was given, um, you know, essentially, um, how has MRHA affected uh, re the relationship between religion and politics in Singapore? Um, and, and what are the strengths and, and weaknesses, you know, of the legislative regime that we have? Uh, I thought it'd be useful for me to just uh, list down some of the, the key arguments um, here. Um, first is, is that I think when we look at the relationship between religion and politics in Singapore, I think one can say that the relationship is on an even keel. Uh, I think there is a significant reservoir of trust between uh, the faith communities um, and, the, uh, and the government. Um, as well as between you know, the, the religious leaders um, and the political uh, leaders. But one of the things that I'll raise uh, in the course of my presentation would be that um, maintenance of religious harmony is not just uh, dependent on the elites, um, but that there, there will be the need to broaden uh, that harmony discourse, if I can put it that way, uh, you know, to the faith communities um, at large. Um, I think in many ways, you know, the MRHA doesn't break new ground in, in, in that the, the notion of uh, you know, trying to separate religion and politics uh, was not new in Singapore, right? Back, back in, in 1990, I, I think uh, over the years between 65 and, and 1990, um, you know, that there were certain ground rules in place, um, but the government took the view, uh, particularly in, in the light of developments in the late 80s, um, you know, that perhaps it might be useful uh, to frame some of those ground rules. And so I, I would like to describe uh, the MRHA very much as a sort of operating system, um, you know, that has in many ways, um, you know, guided uh, politics uh, and religion uh, in Singapore. Um, the third key point that, that hopefully will resonate through my presentation, you know, would be what I call the three R. Uh, framework, you know, and, and, and that's the, the notion of rights, responsibilities, um, and regulation. I think if we want to talk about religious freedom, uh, as well as religious harmony, I think you cannot run away from the fact, um, you know, that there must be a secure set of rights, uh, that there are responsibilities on different stakeholders, um, you know, not just uh, uh, the government, but certainly the faith communities, uh, you know, the, the religious leaders uh, as well. Um, and that where you will have from time to time uh, rules that may not be observed, then there needs to be um, you know, a, a regulatory framework in place. 
And so I think when, when we try to look at, um, you know, the MRHA framework, you know, uh, whether that, that was pre-1990 before the, the law came into existence, I think it's important to recognize, uh, you know, this virtuous circle, right? Um, you know, that, that, that encompasses freedom, um, autonomy, um, as well as harmony. Now, the, when we look at, um, you know, the, the, the religious harmony discourse uh, in, in Singapore, I think what is not lost, uh, you know, on, on all of us, right, would be the need and imperative uh, for religious harmony. Um, and, and we know the discourse, right, disharmony, contention, conflict, uh, particularly those uh, premise on religion uh, can undermine uh, public order, right? So the sense that, you know, this can, 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 religion can elicit, you know, uh, visceral, uh, visceral responses uh, is something that, that all of us uh, have been told. In the same vein, right, the, the, the aggressive uh, assertion of religious freedom, um, you know, is also seen as, as being detrimental. And so this emphasis on, on harmony, right, in both uh, the religious as well as the secular spheres, I think does provide, you know, that opportunity, you know, for us to consider, right, not just how uh, religious freedom or religious harmony could be undermined, right, but also, right, how religious freedom requires religious harmony and how religious harmony in turn uh, promotes um, religious uh, freedom. So um, I, I won't go through this in any detail, but just to, uh, you know, list the, the timeline, uh, you know, of the, the MRHA uh, paper, uh, sorry, the MRHA law, um, you know, it, it, it I, one could put a starting point, uh, you know, with, um, you know, the, the white paper uh, on the maintenance of religious harmony at the end of 1989. Uh, this is one of those uh, unusual pieces of law uh, that went through two first and second readings in Parliament. Uh, and, and the reason is because uh, Parliament was then prorogued uh, in, in, in April um, and, and under the, the, the previous uh, uh, scheme, there was a need to reintroduce um, the laws, the law again. Um, so in any case, you know, the second reading uh, took place in July 1990. Uh, Parliament resolved to commit it to a select committee um, uh, which reported back in, 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 in October uh, and the third reading of the bill uh, took place in, in, in November 1990 and the MRHA came into force uh, in, in 31st March 1992. Um, there were no significant amendments between uh, 1992 and 2019. Uh, and we all know, of course, that in 2019, uh, Parliament amended uh, the MRHA, uh, but those amendments um, have yet to be brought um, in, in, into force. And as some of you would be aware, uh, the MRHA has not been invoked uh, in terms of, um, you know, the restraining order, you know, which is one of the key provisions, uh, key powers that the MRHA uh, provides. Uh, that has not been used um, at all. Now, I think it's important to bear in mind the context that, that, that led to, um, you know, the, the, the MRHA. I think one, you know, certainly in the, in the late 80s, you know, that there was, um, you know, that first political leadership uh, handover in Singapore. Um, and that took place against, you know, the, the backdrop of uh, a fairly tumultuous period uh, in the world as well. Um, you know, it, it, I, one could say that, you know, uh, that period was perhaps back ended, uh, book ended uh, uh, on one end uh, by the Iranian Revolution of 1979, um, you know, and then we had the the uh, liberation theology, you know, that was uh, very much uh, in vogue, uh, you know, in much of Latin America. Um, there was also the People's Revolution uh, in in the Philippines in 1986, um, you know, as well as uh, Taiwan's. Uh, democratization. Um, but what, I, what I'm seeking to point out here, you know, is, is that the signature of religion uh, in government or religion vis-a-vis -vis government, government was very strong uh, in other parts of the world. Um, the white people, of course, also mentioned about the heightened fervor 
uh, among all religious groups, um, you know, and, and with that, you know, the possibility of misunderstanding um, growing. Uh, and so when, when Home Affairs, uh, uh, then Home Affairs Minister, Professor S. Jai Kumar, uh, moved the bill in Parliament, uh, you know, he made the point that uh, these are emotions which, uh, sensitivities and emotions which can be quickly aroused uh, and, and inflaming passions as well as perhaps uh, you know, barreling towards uh, violence as well. So this is the, the religious composition in Singapore. Uh, I think it's useful to note, um, you know, that in terms of uh, the religious composition, um, by and large, you know, they have remained uh, rather stable uh, since independence, or one could say perhaps even for a few decades uh, prior to independence. Uh, you know, Buddhism and Taoism, uh, you know, the, the statisticians have felt it useful to uh, you know, to, to put them together, but also to provide for separate figures, figures you know, because I, I think that there was that, uh, that the syncretic uh, practices as well. Um, but I think the 2020 census, right, you know, will show that uh, the, the comp religious composi composition remains um, stable. Um, in 2015, uh, you know, in the general household survey, uh, um, done by the Department of Statistics, um, you know, it, it pointed to, um, you know, a slight increase uh, for, for, uh, for people who, who describe themselves as, as Christians. Uh, but I think the, the largest increase was with uh, people who declared that uh, they had no uh, religious affiliation, right? So this grew from uh, 17% in 2010 uh, to 18.5% uh, five years uh, later. I think it's important to know that um, when, when someone says that, um, uh, that he has got no religion, uh, I don't think that necessarily means that they are they're atheistic. I think it, it refers more to, to, to a situation where um, they have not uh, identified themselves, you know, particularly with, uh, with any one um, religion. Um, of course, there, there would be atheists and secular humanists uh, among uh, that 18.5%. Uh, very quickly, you know, the, the faith landscape in Singapore, I think we all are familiar with our secular system of government. Um, I think in Singapore, uh, it is perhaps our, our, our it is a reality that uh, race, language, and religion uh, do overlap, uh, you know, to, 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 to some extent extent, um, you know, for, for certain uh, racial communities, such as the, the Indians uh, and the Chinese, um, you know, the, the, certainly the overlap uh, where race, language and religion are, are concerned is very strong uh, when we talk about the Malay uh, community. Um, and certainly over the years, right, uh, since uh, the, the, the late 1980s, uh, we, we do observe this uh, increased religious piety um, across all faiths. Um, I, I think, again, uh, that would be a general description. It, it may not uh, describe uh, what's happening, uh, you know, to all faiths as well. And certainly, you know, uh, while religion uh, has not been, in Singapore, has not been immune to transnational developments, uh, because uh, every faith, uh, every believer of any faith in Singapore would have core religionists uh, in other parts of the world, uh, and, and and what affects them, uh, what affects uh, that uh, that core religionists in other parts of the world, uh, certainly uh, they do impact upon uh, the 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 core religionists in Singapore, right? So a very prominent example would be, um, you know, the Palestinian issue and how uh, that uh, that continues, you know, to to engage, um, you know, the Muslim community. Um, and likewise, if we talk about the Catholic Church, um, you know, the, the Holy uh, Father in, 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 in the Vatican, um, you know, he still commands that following uh, where the local Catholic Church is concerned. And certainly as well, you know, social media has made, you know, developments in other parts of the world. Um, um, they, they have made those developments um, become, um, you know, um, known to Singaporeans uh, very quickly. Uh, because of, of social media. But I think it's important to, you know, to go back to, you know, what I describe as a founding constitutional moment, right? And, and, and this is where uh, Lee Kuan Yew spoke about 
um, you know, a multiracial uh, nation in Singapore, and and about you know people's religion, language, and cultures, you know, all uh, treated, you know, with with equality, right, and 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 provided with equal protection uh, under the law. Um, and I think this is important when, when you think about uh, you know the the diverse society uh, that exists uh, in Singapore. Um, I've just listed here the uh, the constitutional provision that, that relates to uh, the freedom of religion. Um, it doesn't talk about freedom of belief or conscience. It, it, it mentions specifically religion and it composes of, um, you know, a trinity of rights, um, you know, the right to profess, the right to practice um, and the right to propagate. Um, what is, of course, uh, important is, is to note that this is not, uh, you know, an absolute freedom. And so in Clause 4 of Article 15, um, it, it provides that uh, this article does not authorize any act uh, contrary to any general law relating to public order, public health, or morality. And so what that means is that uh, any law that, that, that seeks to restrict religious freedom must uh, um, minimally Right, deal with public order, public health, or morality. Um, you know, there are no other areas or, or categories in which uh, you know, religious freedom uh, can be circumscribed. Um, the Pew Research Center was something that uh, uh, Dr. Chang uh, mentioned earlier. Um, and, and I think when you, when you look at um, you know, the Pew Research Center, uh, they did a several studies a couple of years back, um, and, and what is interesting is, you know, they, they didn't quite realize, um, you know, the the, the seemingly uh, uh, contrarian uh, conclusions or themes, you know, that they raised in, in the various reports. And so, in April 2014, for example, you know, they they, they described Singapore as the most religious, diverse country or society. Uh, in, in 2015, uh, they, they referred to very high government restrictions on religion uh, in, in, in 2013. Uh, and in a 2015 study, um, you know, they, they pointed to what they believe, you know, would be um, the religious composition, um, you know, changing significantly uh, in, in 2050, um, you know, projecting Muslims to be at 21% and Hindus uh, to be at 10%. Um, but what is of interest to me is really, you know, the, the first and second uh, studies, right? Um, and, and, and I think uh, one could perhaps make the point, or at least I would make the point that um, when we think about, um, you know, religious, uh, a very religious, diverse uh, society, uh, that would mean, you know, the need for uh, a robust uh, regulatory framework. Um, I, I'm not so sure that restrictions, you know, would be the right word. Uh, certainly, you know, that uh, the, the law describes them as restrictions, but I hope we can see that um, given that there's no absolute freedom of religion, um, you know, uh, there, there will be a need to circumscribe uh, some of those uh, freedoms. What is, what is of course, um, you know, often described, you know, in Singapore is, is secularism. Um, and, and in this uh, presentation, I, I just want to offer uh, the term secularity instead. Uh, I think that takes us away from, you know, the, 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 the usual understanding of, of secularism, you know, of which there are various types, um, you know, but essentially uh, it is a principle of governance, um, you know, that, that provides for uh, separation of state um, and religion, right, to varying degrees, um, you know, so you, you can have uh, a fairly austere one like um, the French uh, laicite, um, you know, you would also have, uh, you know, quite a different degree of separation if you look at the US um, or the UK model or even uh, the model in Germany. I think secularity to me is uh, uh, a bit more helpful, a lot more helpful because I think it I, I would like to describe it as the endeavor, uh, you know, to create a framework for, for pluralism, um, as well as the constitutional space uh, for faith communities, as well as non-faith communities, uh, you know, to live um, harmoniously. And I would also add that, um, you know, when we look at secularity, uh, I think it, it, it promotes that principle 
uh, respect, space, and distance uh, between state and religion uh, amid uh, you know, the very strong social diversity uh, that we have in Singapore. Right? So I think when you look at these different themes in secularity, uh, I, I, they are not really captured uh, in secularism. So when we look at secularity in Singapore, um, you know, there is certainly that, that, that separation, right? Um, you know, we, we don't have hybrid institutions, you know, that have a mix of, um, you know, state and, and religion. Um, I, I think perhaps one can say that perhaps the closest would be the Islamic Religious Council of Singapore. But, but other than that, right, uh, you know, and, um, and perhaps some of the statutory boards, you know, such as the, um, you know, the, the Hindu Endowments Board, um, you know, the, 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 the Sikh Board, for example, uh, but otherwise, you know, uh, by and large, uh, the political and religious institutions are, are separate. And, and the operating system is really about, you know, that each sphere doesn't interfere or dominate um, the other, right? So we often look at, you know, religion not meddling in politics, but it is also important uh, to appreciate that politics should not uh, meddle uh, in religion um, as well. Um, and and secular, secularity in Singapore would, of course, entail uh, religious freedom for all, uh, you know, within the limits of um, public order, public health, and public morality, uh, as well as the rights of, of others. Um, and, and I think one can say that, that by and large, you know, there is no institutional discrimination uh, on grounds of religious, as well as non-religious views. Um, you know, there is that equal treatment of all. So I think it's important to recognize that um, although 80% of Singaporeans, uh, you know, describe themselves as belonging to uh, a particular faith, uh, there are about 20% of Singaporeans who do not subscribe to any faith. And so I think it's important, uh, you know, that, that the, there is an even-handed approach, not just between religious groups, but also between religious uh, and non-religious groups. Now, Singapore's approach, of course, uh, it's clear, I think, from, from the earlier um, um, presentation by Dr. Chang, um, you know, that, that the, the, the government is clearly aware of uh, the power of religion uh, to mobilize and to socialize, uh, you know, in, in various areas of the human endeavor, right? So whether you're talking about morality, uh, you know, uh, about, about social conditioning, uh, the economy, uh, and even in politics, um, you know, religion uh, does have that, 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 that mobilizing and transforming power. And of course, people of faith, uh, you know, are often described as being, you know, the moral conscience, right? Um, you know, uh, uh, faith communities uh, provide that, that lens, uh, you know, through which um, state laws and policies uh, are examined, you know, to see, um, you know, to, to determine the applicability, right? So this notion of the transcendental good, uh, you know, is something which uh, the government is very aware of. But I think what is unique about the sec secularity in Singapore is also certainly that, that pragmatism, uh, that pragmatism to harness uh, religion, um, you know, for nation uh, and state building. Um, so, you know, if you look at this, the social services sector, uh, the signature of religious or faith communities is very strong uh, in education, um, you know, the mission schools, you know, whether that of the uh, Christian mission schools or, or, or those run by, by, by the Buddhist, Buddhist communities, I, I, um, you know, they too, you know, play, uh, you know, a big part, um, you know, and, and I think this pragmatism, um, you know, has been helpful, right, you know, because it, 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 it enables, it provides, you know, for, uh, you know, for the authorities to be able to see religion uh, in its various uh, dimension. And, and there is certainly that place of religion, um, you know, in, in the public square uh, in, in Singapore. Uh, I think the courts have described this as accommodative uh, secular, secularism. Uh, and here I want to point that it's quite different from uh, secularism that is practiced in, in, in other jurisdictions. Um, but there is also um, what is important, you know, when we look at, uh, you know, the management of religion uh, really is, is the appreciation that laws do have a part to play, um, but they are certainly not, uh, they are necessary, but certainly insufficient uh, when we think about building 
and developing sustainable interfaith uh, understanding and harmony. Um, you know, and so there is that growing uh, role you know, of soft law, um, you know, which I'll refer to later in trying to nurture uh, the desired values uh, with regard to uh, pluralism uh, in, in Singapore. And so what are the outcomes of secularity in Singapore, right? And, and I think in many ways, you know, one can describe this to, ascribe this to the MRHA, you know, although in my view, uh, you know, we shouldn't uh, make too much of the M MRHA, you know, over uh, the last 30 years, because I think many of the, the outcomes, uh, you know, have been uh, the result of, uh, you know, long-standing uh, rules, you know, that have been, that have been accepted and, and, and internalized by the different stakeholders. Um, and I think what is certainly clear, um, you know, is that security plays a, is, is a very significant dimension of state-church state relations in Singapore. And I think this is where it becomes important to recognize that if faith communities feel insecure, uh, I would argue the state would feel insecure too. Um, you know, and likewise, if the state feels insecure, then religious communities would feel insecure. So in, in many ways, right, the, the security of of these two spheres are, 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 are indivisible. Um, but I think that is also where, you know, it becomes, uh, you know, where you have this secured, uh, religious freedom that is secure, um, is that I think it gives meaning uh, to, to Singapore citizenship. Um, because it, it, it means that a very important identity of 80% of Singaporeans uh, are given uh, recognition uh, and protection. Uh, and I think that adds, you know, a tremendous amount of, of value, uh, you know, to, to secularity in Singapore and how it is practiced, right? So citizenship is meaningful. Uh, there is religious freedom, there's social harmony and, and the state is, is secure. And I think that sets the sort of bedrock, um, you know, for human flourishing, uh, you know, particularly if, if government policies and laws, you know, continue to, enhance, you know, the dignity, uh, you know, of citizens and, and, and people uh, in, in Singapore. Um, so I think, but what we need to recognize, uh, you know, is that uh, the, the state of affairs that we have, multi-religiosity, um, it, it's not sustainable without a coherent set of, 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 of shared values. Uh, shared values are important because they help to discipline um, the shared purpose, right? So, so if you talk about social harmony, uh, you talk about uh, social harmony, stability um, in a multiracial, multi-religious, multilingual uh, nation state, uh, shared values tells, uh, you know, would inform uh, each stakeholder um, what is it that, that, uh, that can be adopted, can be done, can be used, uh, you know, to achieve the shared purpose and also what is it that Cannot be done. In many ways, you know, it tells us how we are, how, right? How are we going to journey, uh, you know, towards the shared purpose of, of a harmonious um, society? Um, and, and so I, I think, you know, it is this framework, uh, you know, of, for pluralism that I think is, is, is important. Now, the, the discourse is, of course, you know, keeping state and church separate. Uh, and, and I think, you know, it, it is not easy, uh, but perhaps, you know, it is something that uh, all st stakeholders uh, have to attempt. Uh, but it's also important to recognize that sometimes bright lines cannot be drawn. Um, so if you think about something like, like the ongoing uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, vaccination uh, effort, uh, you know, is there a religious dimension to it? Um, yes, possibly. You know, the question of whether, uh, uh, what's the origin of, of, of the vaccines, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, what were the sort of stem cells that were used and, 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 and all that. Uh, you know, on the other hand, you know, it, it, it can be seen as something which is, uh, you know, in a political domain, right? It's, it's, it's a health, uh, it's a public health issue. Um, but I think so long as stakeholders are, uh, are alive, you know, to the fact that that there could be overlapping uh, spheres of influence, um, you know, then I think the framework will have to adjust accordingly, uh, you know, and to address, you know, the, the different concerns that, that that arise from, you know, a polycentric um, issue. Um, secularity in Singapore, 
uh, is also particularly protective of minority faiths, right? And in this regard, uh, here I'm referring more, uh, you know, to 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 Islam. Um, and and uh, conscientious objection has been raised. Uh, it is not recognized uh, in, in in Singapore law, um, and that's something which I think, um, you know, will will take um, some amount of effort, you know, to to see whether some sort of accommodation can be made, um, you know, in, in the years ahead. But I think the MRHA, um, you know, right up to um, the, the recent um, amendments, um, I, I think they do underscore uh, some of these themes here. Um, you know, that one is there are multiple identities uh, of a Singaporean citizen, right? We, we, each of us, you know, we do have uh, so-called secular identities. Um, you know that we also do have uh, our spiritual uh, identity um, as well. Um, you know we do have so-called secular values and and sacred values, um, and that these identities and values, you know, sometimes they cohere, sometimes they compete, and sometimes they may even uh, conflict. Um, and, and so you know that that need to to deal with um, you know the the, the, the competing. And the conflicting dimensions, you know, is something that any multi-religious society, you know, will have to grapple with. Um, and I think we have also come to to to, to certainly believe, um, you know, that uh, a good citizen, right, uh, uh, that, that, that civic identity, that civic pride, that civic loyalty, uh, can certainly uh, coexist, you know, with with being, um, you know, a good uh, believer, uh, right, regardless of uh, what's one's uh, de denomination. And I think when you look at uh, what's been happening, you know, since the court in, over the course of, of our, our independence, um, you know, I think what is important to recognize is that, uh, you know, when you have religious identities that are secure, I think, as I said earlier, you know, it helps to promote uh, meaningful um, citizenship. Now, the, the MRHA, right, is not the only law, you know, that seeks to uh, prevent um, you know, or rather to deal with, uh, you know, religious uh, division, uh, religious tension, religious conflict. Uh, you know, there is the penal court, uh, you know, with provisions that, that relate to uh, uh, affecting, um, for example, you know, defiling uh, places of worship or, 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 or religious cemeteries, you know, we do have the Sedition Act about promoting ill will, uh, you know, uh, among the people of Singapore. And in the most extreme case, you know, there is also the, the Internal um, Security Act, um, you know, so the MRHJ joins, you know, that, that sort of um, arsenal, right? Uh, it provides the government, you know, with an arsenal with various calibrated measures. But I think it's also important to recognize that, that there is soft law, um, you know, that is very much used uh, in Singapore. And I think in many ways, you know, they do try to flesh out, in, um, you know, the, the sort of rules and regulations, uh, you know, when, when it comes to the practice uh, of our faith, uh, you know, and, and that includes, you know, uh, propagation as well. And so when you look at the Declaration, of, uh, Declaration on Religious Harmony, uh, which came about shortly after 9-11, uh, um, you know, it, 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 it does try to, to, to flesh out, uh, you know, what are some of the um, ideals, you know, that, that, that um, the practice of religion, you know, ought to uh, steer towards. Um, and then in 2005, you know, th th there was this uh, 10 desired attributes, uh, you know, uh, of the Singapore uh, Muslim community of excellence. Um, you know, I, I, I think it'd be quite interesting, you know, to, um, you know, to try to replace uh, Islam or Muslim with Christian and, and, and to see what comes out of it. Um, but I think, again, you know, it, 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 it tries to, you know, to, to put the context in which, uh, you know, religion uh, has to be practiced uh, in, in a multi-religious um, society. And then most recently in 2019, uh, you know, we had the commitment to safeguard religious harmony. It, it is a fairly long commitment. And what I've done here is to list down, um, you know, seven, the seven themes, um, you know, that, that particular commitment, uh, you know, for which the, 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 the members of the inter-religious organization have, 
have um, you know uh, signed on um, to. So, you know, this again is 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 really secularity at work. Um, you know, so this is an off officer commissioning parade, uh, and when you think about you know commissioning soldiers who who are trained to kill, um, you know, to fight in war, um, you know, we also do have religious leaders uh, that come to to bless. Uh, you know the, the cadets. Uh, you know who who uh, who are being commissioned. So let me just quickly, in the in, in the very limited time that I have left, you know, to try to deal with, uh, to speak on, you know, the, the architecture of peace and coexistence uh, that I think the MRHA, um, you know, has tried to to put in place. We often talk about the MRHA, and and we sometimes forget about the Presidential Council uh, for Religious Harmony, right? Which which is found. Uh, in the MRHA, uh, and and that is uh, you know the body that provides advice you know to the elected president, uh, you know with regard to the restraining orders uh, you know uh, that uh, that the government uh, can impose uh, you know on on a religious leader, um, but I think what what it it emphasizes right really is that need for platforms for dialogue and engagement. And trust building, uh, and here we're talking not just about uh, horizontal, uh, vertical platforms, which is what we are we are most familiar with, but also horizontal platforms, right? So putting religious leaders, you know, on a council, and and perhaps you know getting them to, um, you know, to to see how they can uh, deal with uh, you know difficult issues, you know, that may affect um, um, religious um, harmony. I mentioned about the overlapping. Uh, circles, right? You know that how religion and politics may sometimes cannot be separated into very neat uh, compartments, uh, and I think this is where you know the need for overlapping consensus, you know, becomes uh, important, right? And, and when you have overlapping consensus, you know that is where uh, accommodation uh, becomes critical, right? And and if you think about accommodation in in the usual sense that we are all familiar with, right, traveling and finding accommodation, although that hasn't taken place for a while. Um, you know, we think about, you know, finding a room, you know, in one's home, or unless you're trying to accommodate someone, um, you know, it's about finding room, uh, you know, for someone. Uh, and I think that that's the sort of philosophy, you know, that must endow, uh, you know, our laws, our policies, uh, and uh, mindsets um, as well. I think it's important to recognize that, that there are limitations to what the law can do. Um, because trust is not something which, which, uh, um, which can be taught. Um, you know, it's something which is uh, particularly we talk about religion and, and politics, right? It, it's not just about um, top down. You know, it's also about bottom up as well as between communities. So religious harmony is not just about the state and church coming into tension with, with each other, right? It is also about religious communities. Uh, you know, coming into uh, contestation, you know, with each other as well. Um, and of course, within, you know, our so-called multiracialism multi setup, uh, you know, the role of the government as a trusted and neutral arbiter uh, is something which, which becomes, which is critical. Uh, and I think, you know, that's something which hopefully, uh, you know, government policies will continue, um, you know, to, 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 to emphasize. So if we think about you know the MRHJ right we you know what are some of the positives I, I think you know it's it's certainly about trying it's about accommodation uh, it is also certainly about religious freedom uh, and and the need to internalize uh, democratic values uh, and but and particularly right you know for the state to also appreciate you know that there are loyalties um, you know that go beyond the state uh, you know in the religious sphere. I think it's clear that every faith, every religion, you know, has uh, what one could say, um, you know, elements of tribal exclusivity. Um, but they also contain within them teachings of respect uh, for others. Um, and I think this is where the latter must rise above, uh, you know, the former, uh, you know, if we are not to let, uh, you know, uh, forces in the name of God, you know, to, 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 to divide us. And so this is where I just want to quickly deal with, you know, if we talk about maintenance or religious harmony, uh, you know, the importance of uh, interfaith uh, engagement, 
well, that's not the, the remit of the MRHA. Um, I think it's, it's also important to, to pay attention to interfaith en engagement. Um, but I think what, there is a need to try to broaden interfaith engagement, right? To, to, to not just keep it within uh, religious elites, um, you know, but also to broaden it to the faith communities uh, and to ensure you know, that interfaith engagement uh, doesn't just take place among the converted, but also reaches out, um, um, it doesn't take place in, 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 uh, in, in echo chambers. Um, and so even as we, we, we talk about interfaith engagement, you know, that sometimes need to be, you know, the need to deal with some of the issues and sens sensitivities, sensibilities uh, in, in, in a fairly robust manner. And, and so this is where, you know, I, I, I think uh, certainly within, you know, uh, uh, close quarters, um, you know, difficult questions can be asked. Um, you know, I think that, that it seems that, you know, the, the, the younger Singaporeans want to raise some of these questions in a more open environment. Um, but I think, you know, we need to take that uh, step very, very carefully. Uh, but I think this is, this is where, you know, it becomes important if we talk about interfaith engagement and the maintenance of religious harmony, um, you know, that it's not the job of religious elites alone, right? You know, faith communities need to regulate them, themselves. Uh, there, may be, there may be the need sometimes to rein in uh, religious leaders, you know, who might, who might perhaps step out of line. Uh, and for religious leaders, you know, to be able to, 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 to minister, to shepherd, you know, to their congregations, uh, in a manner that is conducive, uh, you know, to interfaith um, um, engagement, right? And, and so this becomes the, 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 the crux, right? You know, can, can faith communities and leaders uh, be advocates and promoters of religious freedom and religious harmony? I, I think at this point in time, you know, the government probably has the more uh, prominent role, uh, but I think it's certainly a position, you know, that can be shared, uh, you know, by faith communities um, as well. Uh, because the bigger challenge really is whether faith communities can mediate and manage differences, uh, you know, without the, the, the intermediary role of the government. Uh, and, and of particular concern is, you know, if let's say trust in the government were to be lost, uh, you know, if community, faith communities have not learned to, to mediate differences among themselves, then I think, you know, we are in, in, in dangerous ground. So I... I'm actually out of time, um, you know, and, and I still have a, uh, quite a number of slides. So I'm just going to skip over, um, you know, certain parts, right? Um, and here I just want to uh, talk about very briefly, uh, I'll be happy to take questions in a, in, in a Q&A, um, you know, about the, the amendments to the MRHA. Um, I think essentially they, they do broaden the scope, uh, you know, they, they, they seek to deal with foreign donations, uh, foreign interference, uh, it provides for new offenses. It also it also provides for uh, measures, you know, instead of jail term, um, you know, such as a community remedial uh, initiative. Um, it seems as though you know it, it has the makings of of, of an om omnibus uh, law that 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 relates to um, you know to to religious um, harmony, uh, but. Continue even as it changes, you know, uh, there is continuity, right? So it remains very much preemptive in nature to deal with uh, threats before they they actually materialize. Um, but it also does raise question about about the intrusiveness uh, with which, uh, uh, in particular, you know, how religious groups ought to run um, themselves, right? Um, so so there are these uh, disclosures that must be made, uh, you know, uh, presumably to the registry of foreign disclosures um, and and the question is you know uh, how closely would it uh, wrap against you know article 15 clause 3a you know which guarantees you know every re religious group the right to manage its own religious affairs um, you know and again bearing in mind that you know uh, what is what is what is religious and what is what is non-religious can sometimes be, be, be a bit tricky um, and there's also, you know, uh, the, the creates new offenses, you know, such as um, uh, religious leaders uh, knowingly urging the use of force or violence against uh, target groups or, or targets, target persons, right? So um, I, I think when, when, we, when we look at, you know, the, the state of religious harmony in Singapore, 
I think it's, it's key that leadership is important. Um, and, and I think this is where faith communities uh, have that very significant uh, role to play. Um, you know, I think certainly re religion is about competition in, in some respects. Um, but I think, you know, we, we must remember uh, ultimately uh, what, is, what is faith um, um, about. So let me just try to now perhaps quickly, um, you know, uh, uh, conclude, right? Um, I, I think when, when we look at, um, you know, the, the, the various uh, dimensions, um, in some respects, MRHA sort of seeks to codify the church-state separation. Uh, but I think we also uh, are aware, you know, uh, that's what the law seeks to do, but it can never compel a believer, uh, you know, to compartmentalize her life into uh, secular and, and sacred domains. Right? And this is particularly so of Abrahamic faith. And so how do I look at church-state separation and, and why do I describe it as cooperation? I think we should look at a separation as essentially jurisdictional. And I think Dr. Mark Chan, uh, covered that uh, uh, very well in his presentation. You know that in certain spheres, uh, you know, authority is vested in in the government, uh, and in other spheres, you know, it it is it is uh, the church, and neither should usurp um, the other. And so, when you have both church and state acting with justice and righteousness, I think that's where they can affirm and reinforce uh, one another. Uh, you know, in places uh, of overlap. Um, and I do look at, you know, this separation as being protective of religious liberty. Uh, and if you have adequate religious liberty, you are likely to have a state of religious ha harmony. And, and that in turn uh, furthers uh, religious uh, uh, liberty. So, so I would argue that uh, religious freedom and, and social harmony are actually very closely, um, you know, you know um, related. Uh, and, and the need, you know, for, uh, you know, a whole of society approach, uh, you know, in trying to deal with, uh, with uh, bigotry as well as, you know, uh, violent um, extremism. I think we, we, we cannot ignore the fact that um, religion and politics, you know, will probably increasingly overlap uh, as societies become more complex uh, and, and, and diverse. Um, but I think what is clear in the Singapore context is that, um, you know, much as it might seem a bit strange to talk about regulating the, the, the religious sphere, uh, I think the focus is not for most people, you know, it's not about why regulate, you know, but how to regulate, uh, you know, and so that means, you know, utilizing the law, uh, having enlightened policies, uh, uh, developing appropriate mindsets, and, and also growing networks of trust. Uh, and I think it, 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 I think it's also important, you know, to, to recognize that, uh, and, and this has been proven throughout history, Right, that the best of faith will defeat the worst of religion, and that the best of governance uh, can defeat, uh, you know, the worst of politics. Uh, and, and I think that's all to, to, you know, to the greater good of, of uh, you know, human flourishing um, on, on this side of the grave. Uh, and and on, a, on that note, uh, thank you for your uh, kind attention. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, um, Professor Eugene, for your presentation. Um, I've got some questions here, um, quite a few questions, in fact. So I will address those questions that pertain directly to the topic of your presentation, which is on the MRHA. So uh, there's this question here. Um, yeah, were there precipitating violent incidents that resulted in the introduction of the MRHA? So whether would you like to address that? Yeah. Um, I, I'm not aware of. I, I'm not aware of. And of course, you know, in, in, in Singapore, uh, in matters that relate to, to race, religion, and language, uh, you know, the approach of the government has always been to take, pre to, to, to take a preemptive approach. Uh, in other words, you know, to nip the problem in, in the butt rather than to wait for uh, the problem to manifest and then to deal with, to deal with it. You know? so, so our approach is not about, about a clear and present danger standard. Um, so, but in, in terms of the, the question, right, MRHA, I, I'm not aware of any precipitating uh, violent episodes, you know, that, that, that uh, uh, I think if there were, uh, you know, we had 
ready-made legislation, uh, wh whether that, that, that uh, in particular, you know, the, the ISA. Yeah, okay, uh, thanks for that. I think that the same person did ask uh, another question related to the MRHA, and, uh, and that is, if the MRHA has not been invoked for 30 years, uh, is it still relevant? So just maybe your, your quick yes, talk. I, 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 yes, I, I think, I think that, that, that's a very uh, interesting question, you know, in that, uh, you know, it's, it's so-called non-usage, uh, you know, may suggest that, uh, you know, it, it was never needed in the first place. Um, but I think the value of, of the law, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, is that, um, I think it sets an operating system, right? So it operates in the background. Uh, and, and, and so uh, much as I don't think, you know, people of uh, religious leaders like you, you know, when you stand at the pulpit, you know, that you would, that before you speak, you know, you think about MRHA. I, 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 I really doubt that, that that's your approach or, or that of your uh, uh, fellow uh, religious leaders. Um, and so that, that is, that's why I, I take the view that, you know, even though it has not been invoked, uh, I, I, actually, I actually see that as a success, you know, that in many ways, you know, we have internalized, uh, you know, the need for, for an enlightened approach, uh, you know, towards uh, uh, religious activity, uh, you know, particularly when it comes to uh, religious propagation. Um, and... And actually, when you look at MRHA, you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't ordain, you know, uh, any of these things at all. You know, it's actually quite a, a bare-bone uh, legislation. Of course, you know, with the amendments, it has, it has taken quite a different complexion. Um, but I would say that, uh, you know, in, in many respects, um, you know, the, 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 the fact that it has not been used, I, I think, bears a testament, uh, you know, to the fact that uh, we have... Um, we have been blessed, uh, you know, with with enlightened uh, religious leaders uh, and faith communities, you know. But but I don't think the state of affairs is guaranteed. Okay, um, just just broadening out a little bit beyond the uh, MRHA, uh, I have this question here. Thank you, Professor Tan, for your presentation. You've written about Singapore's system for managing low-income foreign workers and Singaporean Christianity's relation to the state. What is your perspective on how Singaporean Christians should relate to the state's governance of foreign workers in light of what you have presented today? Um, what should Singaporean Christians do with tensions that we might perceive between what Christianity teaches on loving strangers and how the state or the government relates to them? So it's a bit on, on this question of uh, yeah, the, the foreign workers. and, and Yeah, how. yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 I'm not sure... Um... You know how religion uh, intersects dire directly, you know, with, with the issue. Uh, but I would just say that, you know, in, in the end, you know, whether we're talking about Christianity, uh, you know, or Buddhism or, or Islam or Hinduism for that matter, I think they all they all have the golden rule. Um, and and that means, you know, I think each of us should, you know, in, in our own ways, uh, you know, try to ensure the dignity, uh, you know, of those who have who have uh, expended significant resources, you know, to come to work in Singapore. Um, so whether it's someone we interact at home, uh, such as a foreign domestic worker, right, or whether it's someone who, who we come across, uh, you know, in the course of our work, uh, you know, I, I think every religion, uh, you know, exhorts, uh, you know, their believers, you know, to treat, uh, you know, each other with respect and, and, and with dignity. Uh, and I think this is where, uh, you know, if, if we, we one, one hopes that, you know, if there is going to be, um, you know, an increase right, in, in, in the cost of, of getting uh, services that are provided primarily by foreign workers, you know, that, that we see that, you know, as part of our contribution, um, you know, to, to ensuring that, um, you know, that there is this minimum dignity, you know, that is accorded to them. Uh, so, so I would say that you know we don't need for the government to, to you know to, to to do something you know the, the, really the, the the ability to make a difference uh, does begin with us. 